Am I audible now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. okay. Yes. Were my slides visible? Now? Yes, yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, so in today's class, we will look at how you know PCR can be used for DNA fingerprinting. Okay, we'll quickly look at the uh, you know basis for it, how it all started, and all that. Okay, uh, I'll skip a few slides. Okay, so a brief history of forensic DNA typing in 1980s. You know, just around the time. Uh, 80, if I remember, 85 was the year when PCR uh, actually got, uh, you know, uh, the first publication, okay? When the world knew that you can do what is called as a PCR. 1980s, uh, there was a scientist called Ray White who first described the polymorphic uh, RFLP markers, which are, you know, by which you can uh, identify individuals, okay? 1985 around the time when uh, pcr got uh, you know famous or when the first publication came a scientist by name alec jeffries discovered multi locus probes which you can which you, which can be used for dna typing or dna fingerprinting we'll we'll look at the you know brief this thing in the subsequent slides okay and 1985 was the first paper on PCR where they were able to, you know, uh, uh, isolate a small fragment of DNA from a genomic pool, which was, which was a big uh, discovery at that point in time. And in a very short time, in extremely uh, short time by uh, scientific standards, in three years, you know, the uh, Federal Bureau of Investigation started work on using DNA for their legal uh, this thing, issues. Okay, 1991, the first paper or the first scientific publication on what is called as short tandem repeats appeared. In 1995, uh, the FSS started a UK DNA database in United Kingdom. And in 1998, FBA launched what is called as the CODIS database, which we will uh, discuss in today's class. Okay. Okay. The human genome, you know, in all these things, in all these things, uh, when you're looking at DNA fingerprinting, we are looking at human genome. Okay. Human genomes, if you compare any two individuals today, they are 99.9% .9 identical. 99.9%. .9 okay. For every thousand people whose genomes have been sequenced, okay, uh, sequencing has revealed one major allele for most genes in human population. There are about, you know, close to 25,000 genes. And each uh, gene, you know, in each population, there is one major allele for each of those genes, okay. Uh, human populations have not been genetically isolated for a very long time unlike other species which uh, you know uh, arose first you know uh, humans have come into the scene very late and they've not had enough time to expand okay and many variations in this genomic landscape or in the human genome dna has not had time to spread throughout population just imagine i mean you know i keep telling you uh, you know uh, 50 years ago or maybe 100 years ago you know, it looked as though each of those countries were islands, you know, uh, there was not much of a uh, mixing. But today with air travel and with, you know, so much of, uh, you know, uh, cross country, uh, this thing and cross cultural marriages, you know, the DNA mixing has become relatively much more compared to what was like, say about 50 or 100 years ago it is going to take some more time for this entire gene uh, you know populations or genetic uh, this thing to spread throughout the uh, this thing to have a uniform uh, this thing okay the human genome as i said are you know any two individuals are 99.9 percent .9 identical which means the difference is only 0.1 percent okay so what would be that amount of variation assuming that you know human genome is 3.2 billion base pairs okay 0.1 person would be 0 0.01 divided by 100 and that is equal to 0 0.001 changes per base pair which in reality translates to 3.2 million changes per genome that means if you take any two individuals they are going to be different 
in 3.2 million alphabets in the genomic DNA. Okay, so in the chromosomal DNA, in between any two individuals, it could be you know brother sisters, it could be unrelated individuals. There are at least 3.2 million changes in the uh, genome per uh, individual. Okay, so, so that that's a lot of variation. There's a lot of variation. And there are two major types of variation. One is called a single nucleotide polymorphisms, where you know you take any gene, okay, and if you were to sequence say uh, thousand uh, odd people, you will see randomly there will be genetic changes. Where in majority of the population you may have you know uh, adenine. In some people it may be replaced by guanine. In some people it may be replaced by cytosine. In some people it may be replaced by thymine. Okay, without affecting the functionality, most of these SNPs, uh, you know, it turns out have no, you know, they don't alter your codons and they generally, you know, fall in the introns, mostly in the introns. You know, why? Because introns far exceed, far exceed the exons. Okay, if you know 3.2 um, million in this 2.2 million base pair genome. Literally 90% of it is junk DNA. Junk DNA in the sense, something that is not coding for anything. So if people used to call it as junk DNA. It is no longer called as junk DNA. It is called as intervening sequences. Okay. And then you have many of these, uh, if you look at genomic DNA, many of the places have several repetitive DNA sequences. Okay, repetitive DNA sequences code for, account for at least at least about 8% of your genome, maybe a little more, but it is around 8% of the genome. Okay, and these variations produce what are called as RFLPs or restriction fragment length polymorphism. So if you were to take any two individuals and say amplify gene A from those individuals. And if you were to do a restriction digestion, you will see different patterns because, you know, the change in the alphabets, okay? G, A, T, C could be distributed, you know, in different ways and that results in the variation and the restriction fragments will be of different length, okay? Okay, so if you look at the uh, human genome, you know, less than 2% of it codes for protein and 50% of the genome contains repetitive sequences. Okay, do these repetitive sequences have any function? They seem to have no apparent function. Okay, these repetitive genes, why are they there? We still don't understand. Okay, and are they involved in recombination? This is still a question mark. It is still being addressed. Okay. And are they responsible for formation of new genes? No idea. It is still a question mark. Okay. So if you look at the types of repeated DNA, as I said, almost, you know, 50% of the genome contains repetitive DNA sequences. And where are these uh, found? They're typically found in uh, telomeres. Okay. Most of the telomeres and most of the centromeric regions of the chromosomes have lots of repetitive regions okay and this repeats can be of two types one is called as satellite dna or variable number tandem repeat and then you also have what are called as mini satellites or short tandem repeats okay variable number tandem repeats and short tandem repeats okay and in between all these things, you have interspersed repetitive DNA, which can come in many different forms. You have transposable elements, you have, you know, uh, things called allo sequences, which are like majority of this 50% of the this thing, repetitive sequences. Okay, they occupy a major of it. And then you have uh, an another series of this thing called lines, which are again, repetitive sequences. Okay, but they are not as frequently found as allo repetitive sequences. Okay, so if you if you look at this graph, it shows that you know you have highly repetitive DNA, you have medium order repetitive DNA, and then you have single copy genes. You know these twenty five thousand genes, you know they all come under single copy genes, and then within this uh, this thing, you still have many genes that form super gene families. So you know you still have to realize that human genome is extremely uh, complex and in spite of the fact that we have sequenced the entire genome, we understand very little of it. 
you know that's the uh, uh, this thing crux of the this thing when everybody thought that human genome sequencing will result in you know all kinds of information no i think we are not there yet okay so if you look at human genome it's a very complex mix of several kinds of dna sequences okay along with non repetitive dna sequences so it has lots and lots of repeats but you also have non repetitive sequence how was this discovered okay in the early days genomic dna was purified using cesium chloride density gradients with ethidium bromide for visualizing under uv light okay two bands were seen okay one turned out to be the main uh, dna the other was satellite band okay Uh, people would have generally discarded satellite but many of the discoveries in science happens because somebody was curious to know ki what is this small band you know they uh, sequence this satellite dna and they realize that it is made of lots and lots of repetitive dna sequences so these uh, main dna was probably the one that was uh, you know unique and then the satellite dna was highly repetitive dna sequence okay so this was this was in the days when uh, sequencing was uh, not very uh, you know common right uh, people had just started sequencing and those even those were early days when people were only sequencing extremely small uh, you know plasmids and small viruses okay human genome was like a far away dream okay okay so tandem repeats are often called as junk dna but it makes substantial part of the genome maybe up more than 10% of the this thing they are spread throughout the genome and they have very very specific structure see although i said 50% of the genome is repetitive you know these tandem repeats constitute about 10% or little more than 10% okay they spread throughout the genome and they have very specific structure they are organized as multiple copies of homologous sequence with size with certain size okay specific size okay these sequences are arranged in head to tail pattern and they form tandem array that means there are multiple copies of the same repetitive sequence we'll see that in our uh, next slide okay tandem dna in the human genome shows a wide range of repeat sizes and organization which can range from few base pairs to several kilo base pair so tandem repeats have now been you know reclassified into few more um, uh, classes okay so tandem repeats can be classified into three classes okay one is called as the satellite dna then you have mini satellite dna and then you have micro satellite dna what is the difference between all these three the difference between all these three in satellite dna you have 100 to 6500 base pair repeats so the length of this green box you know can vary anywhere between 100 to 6500 then again this will be followed by another one of those repeat this will be followed by another one of those repeats you can have multiple repeats okay in the case of mini satellite you can have 10 to 100 base pair repeats multiple times okay in the case of micro satellite uh, repeats okay you have 2 to 10 base pair repeats so i will show you some examples from the human genome which shows about the uh, these repetitive dna is okay so most of the satellite dna is located either in the telomeres or centromeres okay and the nucleotide sequence of these repeats is fairly well conserved across species okay so the number of repeat varies and the difference in how many repeats are present in a region is the basis for dna fingerprint all of us let us say let us say let's look at uh, micro satellite let's forget these two for the time being let's look at this micro satellite dna okay all of us would have received a copy of this micro satellite dna from our father and from our mother right the number of repeats that the mother carries and the number of repeats that the father carries invariably are different okay and so when you when you do a, a pcr and when you do a diagnostic you will be able to very clearly make out you know uh, the contribution of these pairs we will we'll see that in the uh, subsequent slides okay okay so repetitive dna is, this this repetitive dna sequences are what are used for dna 
fingerprinting, as I said, you know, you have satellite DNA, you have mini satellite DNA, you have micro satellites. These are, uh, it used to be, you know, uh, satellite DNAs were initially used for DNA fingerprinting. They gave uh, way to mini satellites. Mini satellites have now given way to micro satellites. And today, you know, for all practical purposes, this is this micro satellites which are used for routine DNA fingerprinting. The repeat unit is about one to four base pairs and around thousand, you know, you have several repeats of the order of thousands of repeats in the human genome. Okay. Okay. The ease of DNA analysis has made mini and micro satellite DNAs to be used in DNA fingerprinting in these days. Okay. It's easy to analyze on a routine basis and on demand a small part of the genome. No, uh, we are thinking of sequencing the entire genome. Initially, it took about a decade, okay, more than a decade to complete the entire uh, genome. These days, people are talking about sequencing the genome in a matter of a uh, few weeks. Uh, people are already on to the task of uh, doing this in uh, days, okay. Eventually, I think people, what people realized is that instead of sequencing the entire genome, it's easy to, uh, you know, uh, PCR out parts of the genome and use it for diagnostic purposes, which in this case, in the case of DNA fingerprinting is more than enough. It is foolproof and it has been shown scientifically that by the use of DNA fingerprinting, you can identify individuals. Okay. So many satellite DNA sequences were discovered by this scientist called Alec Jeffrey while analyzing whale myoglobin DNA, okay? So he invented this technique of DNA fingerprinting. Uh, mini satellites are also called as BNTRs or variable number tandem repeats, whereas micro satellites are called as STRs or short tandem repeats, okay? These are present in the genome. When Alec Jeffries started this uh, DNA fingerprinting technique, he used a technique called RFLP or you know, restriction fragment length polymorphism. And they ran a gel, you know, it would take days to understand what this uh, picture is trying to tell us. But these days, you know, as technology has improved, instead of running and, uh, you know, looking at an autoradiogram, people have started looking at the PCR profile. Okay, so that so that's the biggest change that has happened. Okay, so some of the DNA technologies that are used in DNA fingerprinting or forensic investigations are RFLP, PCR analysis, STR analysis, and mitochondrial and Y chromosome analysis. For today's cl class, we look at these three. Okay, RFLP, PCR, and STR analysis. All right. Okay. So in RFLP, DNA molecules are incubated with restriction enzymes. Okay. And restriction enzymes are generally produced by bacteria, okay, mostly from pro prokaryotes. Uh, the exception is uh, cyanobacteria, which are considered as prokaryotes, okay, uh, the blue-green algae. There are some blue-green algae which uh, produce restriction enzyme, but by and large, most of the restriction enzymes are from prokaryotes, bacterial species, which cut DNA at specific base pairs called recognition sites. And they result in smaller pieces of DNA called as RFLPs, okay, restriction fragment length polymorphism. Okay, so this is a typical example of ECOR1 enzyme. ECOR1 recognizes this enzyme uh, sequence called GAATTC, okay, and it cuts at this G and it cuts at this G in the bottom strand and results in two fragments, okay, a single fragment becomes two fragment, okay, okay. In RFLP analysis, RF stands for restriction fragments, okay? Those are the fragments that are cut by the restriction enzyme. L stands for length and P stands for polymorphism, a Greek term for many shapes, okay? The length of the sum of these fragments can differ greatly between individuals. Suppose you were to take, you know, this piece of DNA between two different individuals and you were to you know, expose it to the ECOR1 restriction enzyme, you may not see the same pattern. This GATTC in one individual may be almost towards this end. In another individual, it may be almost towards this end, okay? In this case, it was here, okay? So you can have differences in the length of this uh, DNA fragment. 
<laughs> now when you do electrophoresis of these rflps it will produce different patterns of dna bands okay but can we do an rflp with human genomic dna it is probably not a good idea because what will happen is it will only produce a smear you know it will only see you will, you will only see all kinds of dna fragments will get restricted so you may not be able to uh, you know uh, make any head or tail of it okay what molecular biologists have done is to identify regions of human genome where rflps are highly variable between individuals okay so we now know by uh, several methods that these are the regions in human genome that are extremely variable between two different individuals okay and rflp markers are most commonly used for dna profile analysis and these are generally found on chromosomes 1 human chromosomes 1 2 4 10 and 17 you know literally every chromosome uh, human chromosome has some kind of a marker okay but by and large by and large for uh, routine analysis you know the markers from 1 2 4 10 and 17 are used okay these rflp markers are named after their location on the chromosome for example the marker on chromosome 2 is called as d 2s44 which means section 44 of chromosome 2 i'll show you uh, what it means okay these chromosomal locations are also called as dna loci okay for example you know ds 44 d2s44 this is the marker that people are going to use it for diagnostic d1s7 means it is found on chromosome 1 section 7 d4s139 means it is found on fourth chromosome and section 139 okay d10s28 that means it is found on chromosome 10 28 section d17s79 means it is found on chromosome 17 and section 79 okay so this is a uh, this is this is something that is now routinely used okay okay so what are short tandem repeats short tandem repeats are highly repetitive sequences and this can be either a tetranucleotide like uh, shown here you will have you can have a a a g a a a g repeated several times or it could be a trinucleotide like c t t c t t c t t getting repeated or it could be a dinucleotide like a g a g a g a g getting repeated several times okay in in the case of dna fingerprinting generally you know people have used tetranucleotides to for dna fingerprinting because it offers a good balance of the ease of interpretation and the variability that is found across populations okay so people have used these tetranucleotides for dna fingerprinting okay what are the advantages of strs or short tandem repeats they are plentiful okay because they are plentiful you only need an extremely small amount of sample typically that's what happens in the crime scene right in the crime scene you may not uh, have uh, you know whole lot of evidence you may have a few hair follicles or you may have you know few drops of blood or you may have you know scar tissues or from you know your skin cells may have fallen extremely small number of samples okay and these are discrete they are easily assigned alleles which can be you know visualized using ladders okay uh, uh, the dna ladders okay you can have digital recording of data see we still uh, for academic purpose we still run agarose gels okay but people no longer run uh, agarose gel they do what is called as capillary electrophoresis and all these electrophoresis are captured by um, uh, cameras and everything is converted digitally we will we will see an example in the coming slides okay uh you have rapid dna purification methods that are available from uh, you know so not only crime scene this could be used for uh, you know uh, archaeological thing this could be used when people are trading in endangered species you know when you want to know whether somebody is using an endangered animal or not you know leathers for example right uh you have uh, uh, definitely people have gone to you know uh, instead of using radioactive uh, sting the radioactive substances which can be harmful people have started using non radioactive uh, methods and the sensitivities has improved multifold okay earlier it used to be terrible but now it is much much better you have small and defined size range which allows for multi 
multiplex detection that means you can do multiple pcrs in the same uh, this thing and there is a potential for automation in fact people have started automation and it is now a well accepted practice what are the disadvantages because pcr is so powerful we need to make sure that avoid contamination okay suppose when when crime scene you would have seen people would have, people always use gloves whether it is crime scene whether it is archaeology or whether it is you know any of those things people use gloves because if you uh, if the person who is uh, you know collecting the sample if you were to if he or she were to use ungloved hands their own cells can contaminate okay and they may have false results okay amplification can produce artifacts but uh, these days this is minimal okay and these are generally less polymorphic than southern based bntr we will we will we'll come back to southern blots a little later but you know this is these are disadvantages but we have turned this many of these things into advantages okay so uh, not really much in terms of a disadvantage okay we saw short tandem repeats what are vntrs vntr alleles are highly variable regions in human dna short tandem repeats are also variable okay but uh, vntrs are highly variable regions okay and this uh, this is a tandem repeat of short dna sequence that is repeated at specific chromosomal locus okay and tandem repeats are interspersed throughout the human genome the number of repeats at a given place on a certain chromosome is highly variable from one person to another the number of such repeats is usually different on the paternal and maternal members of the chromosomal pair okay for example all of us as i said inherit one set of chromosomes from the father one set of chromosomes from the mother if we were to look at the vntr in the parental chromosome in the mother's chromosome and the father father's chromosome invariably they are different and that is what you know is your complement okay okay so this this just shows you know a region okay uh, of the human chromosome okay where you have short you know variable number of tandem repeats okay if you look at this if you are to blow up in person a you you know person a can have these many copies of this person b can have these many copies person c can have only a few copies okay so that is what is exploited for dna fingerprinting okay so 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 there are three different variants uh, shown here but in reality it could be 50 different variants for just this short region just for the short region okay similarly every chromosome every chromosome has a vntr region okay and so mathematically mathematically if you were to do this you know uh, it results in the combination of about uh, 10 to the power 18 or 20 something like that it's extraordinarily large number but the human population at this time is about uh, you know less than uh, i guess less than uh, 10 billion and so that number is so huge that each individual on this planet earth can be typed by dna fingerprinting okay that's that's the uh, beauty of this uh, this thing dna fingerprinting okay so analysis of vntr locus most commonly results in two band pattern okay which which is basically because one band is from the father and one band is from the mother you may get only one band sometimes and that happens when both the parents have exactly identical number of copies okay if you if you go back you know let's say uh, person a person a could inherit this many from the uh, father and this many from the mother okay uh, but it is possible that very rarely very rarely that uh, that person could be inheriting the exactly the same number of copies from both the parents okay so it is possible but it is a very rare thing but typically you will always see two bands you will always see two bands except that very rarely you will see single band okay a one band pattern occurs if size of the two parental bands are like same or nearly same very very uh, rare okay so for illustration purpose it has been shown here okay in this simple uh, example of three different alleles which are designated as a b and c you can actually see six 
unique DNA profiles are possible. You know, you can have a combination of any of these three. And then that is what results in the DNA fingerprinting. Okay. And this, this just shows you schematically, you know, how uh, this could be in an, any individual. Okay. You can have a combination of different, uh, this thing. You can have B and C. So this is one individual. This is another individual which has, who has, you know, uh, who is homozygous at uh, the loci C. Okay. This person is homozygous at loci B. This person is homozygous at loci A. Okay. And so when you do this VNTR allele typing, what will happen is, you know, you will see this is what is the thing for B. This is what is the thing for A and this is for C. Okay. So three, there are six possible genotypes. You have A, A, B, B, C, C, A, B, B, C, and AC. So these are six possible um, genotypes possible for just three alleles. Okay. Just three alleles. And there are there are about 14 different alleles that the FBA has chosen so that you know the number becomes huge that you know you will not probably make any errors when you do DNA fingerprinting. Okay. So the FBA has been a leader in developing DNA typing technology for use in the identification of you know criminal or violent people. In 1997, you know, way back, okay. The FBA announced the selection of 13 short tandem repeat to constitute the core of the United States national database called CODIS or Combined DNA Index System. Okay. All CODIS STRs are actually tetrameric repeat sequences and all forensic laboratories that use this CODIS system can contribute to the national database okay there are 50 uh, different states in the us and all of them have this uh, you know um, option either to contribute to the nation, national database or keep it to themselves okay we'll not worry about that okay for example in the seventh chromosome d7 s280 section 280 is one of the 13 core uh, CODIS STR genetic loci. This is found on human chromosome 7. And the tetrameric repeat of this is GATA. This, this, this sequence is found on chromosome 7 at section 280. And different alleles of this locus have anywhere between 6 to 15 repeats of this sequence. You know? So uh, across uh, you know different uh, people, you can have anywhere between 6 to 15 different repeats. So in this case, for example, this is a section of the uh, human DNA. Okay. And you can see GATA, GATA, GATA being repeated. So in this case, I think it is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, I think 13 or 14, 15 uh, repeats are there. Okay. So this, this repeat size can vary anywhere between 6 to 15. Okay. In some people, it may be repeated only 6 times. In some people, it can be repeated 15 times. In other people, it can be repeated anywhere between 6 to 15. Some people may have 7, 8, 9, 10, all the way to 15. Okay. Uh, this is another example. This is another example of uh, in chromosome 18 section 51 okay so it is labeled as d18 s51 section 51 which has this aaga being repeated 14 times okay so this this again you know this can be variable between any two individuals but remember all of us are a combination of two individuals, one from the father and one from the mother. Okay. So the mother's copy number may be different and the father's copy number may be different. And this is what is, you know, potentially exploited in the DNA fingerprinting technology. Okay. When profiles from a single uh, VNTR loci from unrelated individuals are compared, the profiles are normally different. However, it is possible for two individuals to have the same profile at one or two loci, not all the 13 loci. Okay, that is going to be highly improbable. Okay, but the chances of more than one person having the same uh, DNA profile at four, five, or six different VNTR loci is extremely small, extremely small. Okay, in fact, if you were to use a combination of 13 different loci, it's, it's practically impossible. 
okay it's practically impossible so this is what i was telling that uh, you know these days these are uh, this is the age of uh, all electronic stuff right there's nothing people uh, no longer uh, run gels the way we do uh, people do uh, uh, capillary electrophoresis and you know uh, in this case for example okay uh, in this section in in d3 means third chromosome section 1 Three, five, eight. There are these are the possible uh, genotypes that is possible. Okay, anywhere the repeats are anywhere between twelve to nineteen repeats, and depending on the length, you know, you will see a ladder getting formed. Okay, in another loci called VWA, you can have anywhere between from eleven to twenty-one. Okay, repeats. Okay, and all these are uh, seen here. Okay, and in this case, uh, this loci called FGA, you can have anywhere, anywhere between, um, I guess, eighteen is the lowest number to twenty-nine. Okay, uh, I I'm not sure what this twenty-six point two, but I guess it is a it's a variation. Okay, I'm not sure. I'll uh, check and get back to you. So if you were to look at this person called Norma, okay. Uh, norma could be anybody you know it could be any any person so norma's genotype is 15 you know the she uh, he or she carries 15 repeats in chromosome 3 okay that means uh, uh, this locus is homozygous for parents you know both the parents have same number of repeats okay in this case uh, you know she has two uh, loci at bwa okay one has 14 repeats one has 16 repeats i guess you know either parents you know who have contributed to normal's genome you know one of them had a 14 repeat the other one had a 16 repeat okay in the case of fga loci you have 24 and 25 so you can imagine this electronic pcr or this capillary electrophoresis is able to separate to uh, very extremely closely related dna fragment that are differing only by four base pairs okay so that's the power of uh, capillary electrophoresis so norma's genotype uh, is 15 at uh, loci d3s 14 and 16 at vwa 24 and 25 at fga loci okay Okay, so if you look at the frequency of these, you know the uh, VNTRs in the thirteen uh, uh, combined DNA uh, index system, the STR loci, you have a mix and match of different frequencies. So you have a frequency highly frequent alleles, and you have you know less frequent alleles, and then to characterize you know uh, whether it's a male or a female, you also have markers from the XY region. Okay. Okay, so how common or rare would this 13 locus DNA profile be in a reference population? In most cases, by what is called as a product rule, calculation can be done by multiplying each individual probability together. So by combining the frequency of information for all the 13 codis loci, the frequency of this profile would be one in 7.7 quadrillion. Okay, so that is almost like one in seven point seven times ten to the power fifteen. Okay, so we still don't have that many people in the world. Okay, so if we were to you know type any two individuals, we will still be able to you know discriminate between two individuals uh, very uh, distinctly. Even if they are identical twins, you still be able to make certain uh, you know uh, changes. You will still be able to detect two identical twins. Okay, the technology has matured to that extent. Okay, what I thought was in our next class we will look at the applications of this in uh, you know uh, crime scenes and uh, what happened during the nine uh, eleven disaster in uh, US and what happened during the tsunami and all that. Okay, any questions on today's this thing? i will share i will share the uh, presentations okay um, the entire one just as i shared for the cloning one i will share this entire one once this module is done all right okay okay uh, so, okay thank you thank you so um 
if there are no questions we will meet again on uh, friday i guess right friday we'll meet we'll conclude this and then we will start looking at you know some of the enzymes and uh, maybe i will do one spend some time trying to tell you uh, what are the different ways by which we can do pcrs you know uh, many different ways by which you can one example that you saw today uh, you know in one uh, pcr right in a single pcr they are able to look at at least three different uh, these things you know three different low side okay. you can do multiple uh, pcrs you know with one genome suppose i want to amplify multiple genomes uh, multiple genes from one genome you can still do that so this this is called as multiplex pcr so we look at couple of different pcr types and then we will move on to the enzymes that are commonly used in molecular biology so to an extent that should conclude this module all right okay so we'll meet on friday then okay okay sir okay then